welcome back. This presentation is going to be a Colorado Roundtable. Um, we have uh, Lucy Kay is representing sort of a, a smaller city. She's from Breckenridge. Commissioner Pace is representing a medium-sized jurisdiction. He's from Pueblo. I'm from Denver, a larger city um, in Colorado. And then we have Louis Kosky, who is from the state, who will sort of give us a broad overview. But first, I'm going to go ahead and read their bios for you. Lewis, who is right there in the middle. Um, Lewis serves, well, no, Lewis is in the darker suit. Lewis serves as a deputy senior director for the Colorado Department of Revenue, overseeing the liquor, tobacco enforcement, gaming, racing, auto industry, and the marijuana enforcement division. Lewis has been an integral part of the MED, which licenses and regulates both medical and retail marijuana industries. Lewis has been the department director for two years and has served in leadership role with AMED for the past 10 years before assuming his current role as a deputy senior director of enforcement. Lewis was essential in preparing the division for the implementation of retail marijuana regulation, developing streamlined business processes, forming the division's field investigative unit, and as director, Lewis led the meds enforcement and policy priorities, promulgating regulations and rules, and developing a regulatory framework as marijuana legalization continues to evolve. He will continue to be involved with the development of the division, working closely with the MED director, the new MED director, Jim Burak. Prior to joining the Colorado Department of Revenue in 2004, Lewis served as a police officer in Arvada, Colorado, and in the Army National Guard as a military police officer and inf infantryman with service in Slovenia, Croatia, and Bosnia. He is currently pursuing a doctorate in public administration with a focus on policy analysis. Here's to Lewis. Yes, 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 yes. Um, then Sal Pace is the commissioner. He's a Pueblo County commissioner representing 160,000 residents of Pueblo County. Commissioner Pace was appointed to the board of Pueblo County Commissioners in January of 2013 and was reelected in 2014. Commissioner Pace maintains an expert knowledge of the policy, rules, and laws and industry trends in marijuana. While serving as a Colorado State Representative from 2009 to 2013, Sal served in many leadership positions, including House Minority Leader, House Minority Leader. Commissioner Pace served and passed more amendments onto marijuana regulatory bills, House Bill 1284 and Senate Bill 109 than any other legislature. Commissioner Pace served as a state representative until January 13th when he was appointed to the Pueblo County Board of County Commissioners. In Pueblo County, Commissioner Pace has led Pueblo County's policymaking and rulemaking for all cannabis-related regulations. Welcome, Commissioner Pace. And last, we have Lucy Kay from Breckenridge. She is the CEO of the Breckenridge Tourism Office. Uh, most notably in the ski industry sector. The Breckenridge Tourism Office is a destination marketing and management organization which helps to drive nearly 500 million in taxable sales revenue to Breckenridge, Colorado. She previously held various executive roles within Vail Resorts before she came to marketing with Breckenridge and Keystone Resorts. Lucy held senior management roles at the Copper Mountain Resort um, Mountain Resort in both marketing and HR. As principal, Lucy, LK, and Associates, Lucy supports clients including Interwest, Replay Resorts, Telluride Ski Co., Vail Valley Jet Center, USA Pro Challenge. Lucy is an officer on several nonprofit and industry association boards, as well as a governor appointed commissioner for the Cumbres Tolic Scenic Railroad. Lucy holds a BA in economics from the University of Pittsburgh, a master's in international management from the American Graduate School of International Management, and is a lifelong learner, skier, and cyclist. Welcome, Lucy. So we're just going to jump right into our panel discussion. Um, we're going to have, uh, Lewis is going to start first and sort of talk about from the state standpoint um, and then talk about the local jurisdictions and then we'll move in and have each of the local jurisdictions talk a little bit about what's new and different in their areas. 
Thank you, Ashley. It's uh, sure an honor to be here today. Uh, before, before I get started, I just wanted to thank Ashley and uh, all the staff members with the uh, city and county of Denver. Uh, we have, as a state, uh, really enjoyed just an incredible uh, relationship, whether it's uh, Ashley's office or Excise and License, Police Department, um, all the various agencies within Denver. It's uh, kind of a comparable in size almost to the state. And so having that uh, really close working relationship with them has just been uh, really helpful, very collaborative, and, and, and really constructive. And as a result, I think a lot of the policy at the state level is somewhat influenced by uh, feedback that we get from local jurisdictions. So thanks again for having me here. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, and I can't quite see anymore because of the lights, but somewhere right back in there, there's like two rows of uh, marijuana enforcement division employees, and uh, where I get to kind of talk to you all about some high-level numbers and some the things that are going on within our state system. The, the people that really do all the hard work uh, are back there, out there in the audience, and I would really encourage you, if you guys don't mind just raising your hands, you don't have to because I can't see, but uh, if you guys raise your hands, that, that's that's where, where you go. I see there's a whole crew over here as well. So uh, th those are the folks that, have, that, that are experts, experts on licensing, experts on field enforcement, our metric system. Uh, we, uh, we made a conscious effort uh, a number of years ago to, to look for and hire the best and the brightest that, that came to us. And uh, uh, as you get a chance to talk to them, you'll see what I see is they're just a, a credibly resilient group of people that are uh, working in a very dynamic and kind of adverse situation uh, uh, and when it comes to government. So thanks to the MED folks and all the hard work that they do. So that's all my thank yous. I don't want this to sound like an Emmy speech. So uh, uh, I, 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 I want to kind of talk a little bit about maybe try and frame a little bit because I know there's a lot of folks here too that come from outside the state. Really, what 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 is the the size and scope of uh, uh, and the structure around the legalized? Uh, uh, commercialized marijuana market here in the state of Colorado. And when I talk about the commercial market, I'm talking about both uh, the medical side and the retail side. Uh, and, and, and no matter what we do, we're, we're really focusing at the state level on, on three primary goals when it comes to this, this structure. And, and it's to, to do everything we can to keep this out of the hands of people who are not authorized to have that. So in the medical world, that's non-patients. In the retail world, that's anyone who's under the age of 21. Uh, and so that's when, 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 we, when we think in those terms, uh, every time we're working on uh, regulations or helping out at the legislature, we're really focused on, on that aspect. The other thing we're really concerned about is uh, ensuring that we do everything we possibly can to limit the amount of diversion of marijuana that's in the regulated commercialized market from leaving the, the regulated market and, and uh, leaving the state or, or ending up in the wrong hands. And then, and then last but not least, we're also working really hard on the front end to ensure that we, we do everything to prevent the criminal element from participating in the regulated market. Uh, and, and, and I think that's a really important one, especially in the context of, of today and, and, and uh, a talk about local jurisdictions, because that's really where the collaboration and the partnership starts between the, the state and 321 different local jurisdictions that are here uh, within Colorado. And, 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 and so uh, one of the core components of this regulated market is the local jurisdiction's ability to be able to opt in, opt out, or when they opt in, to be able to adopt ordinances or county resolutions that are, are either are, are more restrictive than the state. So when you look at our statutes, the state statutes, essentially they uh, they, they establish the baseline, the minimum standards for operating within the state of Colorado, both on the medical and retail side. And then local jurisdictions, they can, they can create ordinances and resolutions that are, are more restrictive. So for example, uh, we, uh, we offer up hours of operation in regulations uh, that are seven days a week. If, if a local jurisdiction wanted to have you closed on Sundays or if they wanted to limit those hours uh, on the front or back end, they would have the ability to, to to do those kinds of things. So before I, before, uh, uh, I, got in, uh, before I get too much into the numbers, um, I, think, I think it's really important to understand that, that local jurisdictions, uh, they, they've taken you know, vastly different approaches to uh, marijuana, commercialized marijuana. Uh, and so I mentioned earlier, there's 321 local jurisdictions within the state of Colorado. That local provision allows 
the smallest municipal, municipality within a county, within a state, to decide for the, themselves. So if a county decided we don't want any commercialized marijuana, municipalities within that county could still decide, well, we're going to opt in for a variation of that. So, but regardless of the, the, the different uh, approaches to marijuana policy within all those jurisdictions, uh, we've, we've, to date, we've seen 217 of those 321 who've said, no to commercialized marijuana. Uh, so that's, that's the, the vast majority numbers wise in terms of numbers of counties and municipalities have gone the route of not approving some form of uh, legalization. While on the other hand, uh, we've had uh, a, a 16 that are medical only, nine that are retail only, and then we have a, a, a what kind of tops it off, a close to 100 that have, have some sort of uh, just medical, just retail, or a combination of the two. So about a, right around a third of those that, that have opted in. So, uh, for, so if you look at some of the jurisdictions that are, are just medical only, of which there are 16, Colorado Springs, which is south of Denver here by about an hour, hour and a half, uh, depending upon traffic and accidents. You probably could tell me a little better, <laughs> Commissioner. But they, uh, the, the Colorado Springs is probably the largest medical-only jurisdiction within the state of Colorado. Uh, while on the retail side, the city of Aurora, which is just east of where we sit here today, uh, is probably one of the larger retail-only jurisdictions within the state. And then, of course, Denver, where we sit today, it's the largest medical and retail. So in some way, shape, or form, all of these uh, local jurisdictions have made decisions on how they're going to, to proceed forward. So to kind of get a sense of how big that is then within the state, within the 100 or so jurisdictions that have, that have some form of, of, of uh, legalized or medical marijuana within their, their jurisdictions, right now there's, there's right around the 2,800 mark in terms of licensed premises within the state of Colorado. Uh, so those are our businesses that actually operate within the commercialized uh, market. Um, the 2,800 doesn't mean that there's 2,800 different storefronts or 2,800 different places. A lot of a lot of our cultivations, for example, have multiple licenses at the same at the same location. But 2,800 is still a lot, and they're treated uh, as they should be as different licensees. They have different requirements, and as you, you'll hear tomorrow from uh, Chief Miller from MED, you know that 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 creates a, a, a pretty substantial work load for, for MED to keep everyone in compliance. So 2,800 businesses, we also occupy, uh, we are uh, 28 licensed premises. It's about eight or 900 different companies then that operate those 2,800 licenses. And we also license all of the, the people that work and have something to do with the, the seed to sale, manufacturing, uh, uh, point of sale, cultivation, all those things. Everyone who participates in that has to be a license as well. And I think the last number I heard was somewhere close to 28,000, it might even be more, of, of, of active support and key occupational badges uh, that are cur uh, currently in the system. So. That's a lot of fun, licensed premises, big deal. How much does that mean in, in, in marijuana? How much is the state of Colorado accident actually actually producing uh, with the, this uh, machinery of 2,800 licensees? And I think, it, you know, if you look back at our annual report, which incidentally is online, uh, we, were, we're, we're, we were, during that year of 2015, we were roughly cultivating somewhere right around 600,000 plants at any given time. So we can go into our inventory tracking system, we can tell um, uh, in big aggregate numbers how much uh, a licensee is producing, but we can also, our, all, our, all of our licensees are producing, but we can also look at it on an individual licensee by licensee basis. But right around that 600,000 uh, mark. And, and just to kind of put that in perspective, I think, um, when you look at what our licensees are authorized to produce, uh, between medical is right around, in 2015, they were growing about 50% or a little more of their actual plant allotment. And then in the retail side, they were growing somewhere in the neighborhoods of, of less than 50% of what they were authorized to grow. So, but still 600,000 uh, plants is a lot. That, uh, that equates to about 21,000 pounds of marijuana that's being sold around the state. Uh, during any given month, uh, and towards the end of year uh, in 2015, that equated to about 700,000 medical and retail edible units that were being sold around. Is everybody taking notes on this? Make sure you get all. If you, it's all in the annual report. So, 
So um, uh, Ashley, when we were talking about this, she asked me to talk a little bit about uh, a lessons learned approach. And, and there's, there's a, t a ton of lessons to be learned from, from being first, right? We, we, uh, we didn't have any type of uh, rules or regulations to go off of. We had to essentially start from scratch. But one of the things that I, that I recall most, and it kind of kind of goes back to the licensing days uh, or the 2010 uh, medical days when we had our uh, um, uh, offices in the dog track. Is there anybody here that visited us at the dog track? I'm sure there's a couple in here, but so uh, uh, so in that one of the biggest challenges we faced at that point is we were actually starting to implement a regulatory framework within an industry that had already been operating for two or three years. And I can tell you right now, based on our experience, it's, it's exponentially more difficult. Uh, to, to try and regulate an industry that's already been operating versus starting from uh, scratch where there are no licensees quite yet. There's a lot of people that are interested uh, and you start moving down, uh, uh, you start moving down that path. And, and we, we didn't see that just with licensing. We experienced that too as we, we, we implemented inventory tracking um, and uh, a number of other regulations related to edibles and things like that. The, the licensees uh, have also had to be very uh, um, uh, adaptable um, and, 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 and be able to navigate a lot of what has been very dynamic changes in, in statutes and regulations. So, that, so it's, been, it's been a challenge. You know, one of the ways that um, that we've approached this because as, as the state uh, uh, rulemaker, we, we, we're, ch we're tasked with creating regulations around some very difficult issues. Production management, what is a licensee allowed to produce and, and how much and, 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 and what do we do if they're producing too much? Um, uh, edibles regulation has been you know, a very uh, um, prolonged kind of evolution over the last few years. And, and the, the process that we've always taken is, is to, to ensure that that we're trying to get as many people to the table to have the conversation about how we can address uh, those uh, those difficult issues. So we identify a problem uh, as, as a state agency. Then we bring all the, the stakeholders to the table to come up with all the policy alternatives that are out there so that we can kind of start to determine, uh, is, are, are these policy alternatives, are they efficient? Uh, um, are, are they going to be equitable to all the players as, or as much as possible? And, are, and, and where do they fall along the spectrum of being really simple versus really complex? And so what's our likelihood of actually being able to successfully implement that? So um, I, 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 I'm a really big proponent of that process. And, 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 and I, I really think that in a lot of ways, uh, we've arrived at some really good policy that continues to have Colorado lead leading the way in this because we wanted to have local jurisdictions with us at the table to, to better understand what the impact was on them for certain regulations. But we also have the industry and what that does is it gives us an opportunity to really be able to take a hard look at what the right balance is between promoting and, and ensuring the public interest is served in all these regulations. But at the same time, um, our, our objective as the state regulator wasn't to put these businesses out of business. It was it was to, to ensure that the, that the uh, regulations were appropriate um, and that they and they hit that right balance where they could still be able to conduct business uh, and and uh, survive over a, a period of time. While at the same time, we're we're staying true to those first three things I talked to you about: keeping this out of the hands of kids, making sure that we prevent the criminal element uh, uh, from participating as much as possible, and ensure that the, uh, our marijuana product is, is the, the, the diversion out of the regulated marketplace is as limited as possible. Okay. So next, um, we'll have Lucy talk a little bit about uh, your approach in Breckenridge and your city's decision to opt in and, and anything that happened over the last couple of years that you think we'd be interested in hearing about. Great. Thank you, and um, my compliments to this audience. I think it's quite impressive to see the diversity of who's in the group and uh, in particular the people who traveled from abroad. So thank you for including me in this. Um, Breckenridge, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a small community that sits at 9,600 feet, about uh, two hours west of Denver. We're a national historic district, and we sit at the base of uh, the Breckenridge Ski Resort, which is the number one or number two most visited resort in the country. So in terms of permanent residents, we're maybe 4,000 people, and we swell to 
as much as 30,000 during peak season. There's only a few days when we might actually have that many, but just to give you an idea of, of the size of the community. It's a community that is um, pretty casual. We are fiercely protective of our brand and very fiercely protective of our lifestyle, and the brand and the lifestyle happen to be one and the same. Breckenridge, um, in the early, I think it was 1994, decriminalized um, possession of marijuana, um, and that was by a vote of 70-some percent. Um, when medical marijuana uh, was up for a vote, that again passed in Breckenridge very easily, roughly 70%, and the same thing with uh, retail in 2014. Um, the, uh, initially, when um, medical marijuana was allowed, we had a limit of four um, uh, businesses, four licenses that were permitted. And we limited them to one per block. There's roughly four main blocks in Breckenridge, and then you get on the fringe. And <laughs> remarkable. And uh, you know they couldn't be next to each other and all that, all that sort of stuff. So uh, what happened was uh, three of the four, and, and the licenses are not transferable. We're not transferable and are not today. So they didn't become a commodity in and of themselves. So uh, three of the four shops had moved out to a location just outside, just north of town called Airport Road. And, you know, cheaper rents and all that sort of thing. Um, then uh, when the retail um, ballot passed, we had one shop that was left on Main Street. And we also, even with the medical um, businesses when they were in town, we had uh, regulations that they couldn't be right on the main street. They could be on the second floor, or they could be on, on the lower level fl um, levels, uh, like one uh, one story down. Um, but they couldn't be at eye level on main street. So that wasn't a problem. We had one retail shop left um, that was on the second story and right in the middle of town. Um, great business, really good business, business people. And their lease was going to be up in 2015. So while we had been sailing along very smoothly with all these changes, um, this business wanted to be grandfathered in and be allowed to stay on Main Street. So we had a huge, um, very difficult uh, year-long dialogue as to whether or not that should be allowed. Did we want to run a business off of Main Street or make an, one exception for this group? So in the course of, and, and it, it was the one, uh, it was a fiercely divisive topic in the community. Our town council was split down the middle. Um, my board of directors was split down the middle. We were concerned about, is this going to hurt the brand? Um, I will tell you that, uh, you know, it was a, it's in a really cute yellow historic building, just picturesque. Um, the sign was Breckenridge Cannabis Club, and I would walk the street and watch families with kids sit under that sign and take a picture because it was history, right? It wasn't a horrible thing. Um, anyway, the long and short of it was, we well, we had CNN um, arrive in Breckenridge at that time, and they did an eight-part documentary on this issue. And out of curiosity, how many people in the room saw any part of that? That's, that's, that's pretty typical. Um, I couldn't actually make it through. I, I turned it on, and it was just more reality TV than documentary, at least when I tuned in. So I actually never watched the whole thing. And I thought, well, if there's something we need to deal with from a tourism marketing perspective, you know, I would hear about it. And while we had a lot of um, social ch media chatter, certainly when these um, segments were airing, um, pro and con, um, most of the comments that I got back was how beautiful Breckenridge was presented in the documentary and the story wasn't, you know, people took it with a grain of salt, I guess. Anyway, the long and short of it was um, we did have that business move um, to uh, out on Airport Road with the other four businesses. We currently have two retail businesses and two retail medical businesses out there, and they're doing well. Um, they've changed their name uh, from Breckenridge Cannabis Club to um, Backcountry Cannabis Company because they've now bought um, locations in other resorts, and other resorts don't like to have the name of Breckenridge. You know, Crested Butte doesn't want Breckenridge in their town. Um, so that has worked very well for them. Um, a word on the business. The, um, the 
the clientele that comes to these shops is by and large the clientele that we are drawing to the community anyway. They look like the people in this room. I mean, it is, it's not a new demographic. Um, we didn't know that that would be the case, but that's pretty much what happened. And the business cycles really follow the business cycles of the ski business in the winter and our summer tourism business in the summer. For example, um, the, in 2014, first year for retail, they were expecting the big blowout on 420, which is the big celebration, and it was really quite dead in Breckenridge for the um, marijuana shops because the ski resort was closed, and that was a big shock. So it really is an amenity for the guests who come to the community, um, whether they're users or whether um, you know it, it's sort of an attraction. Uh, we, we had a discussion like this recently at the um, GBTA here in Denver, which is the Global um, Business Travel Association, so meeting and convention planners, that sort of thing. And uh, one of the things uh, that happens in Breckenridge when we have meetings and conventions come in, typically in the summer months, a lot of the um, attendees want to get the shuttle and go down to Airport Road to see the marijuana shops. They're not interested in purchasing, but it's the curiosity. They want to see it. They want to go in and talk to the people. So it, it is really functioning as more of an amenity. We started doing research in 2014 with our guests um, to really find out, you know, are they coming because of it? Are they never going to come back because they saw it and they're horrified? And, and our, our research really mirrors what we see in Denver and the state. Um, our numbers even perhaps a little more so, but 85% of our guests um, say it has no impact. What's, they don't care one way or the other. And roughly 7.5% you know, it's, it, they're coming not because of it, but it, it's, it's part of the decision set, and there's 7% that find it, um, you know, offensive at some level. So the majority don't care. Um, we've done that survey for two years. Uh, we do high season, low season. We probably will drop the research this year because it hasn't changed. We might turn it on just in a peak period to make sure. Um, but that is, uh, you know, for us, and then in terms of revenue, I'll just touch on that for a moment. The revenue uh, that's generated by the uh, sales tax on marijuana is less than 1% of our total tax revenue. So it's really fairly inconsequential to us. We use the money. Um, this year, uh, this year is actually the, the revenue is down a little bit, and we attribute that to more competition in surrounding communities. But the tax revenue take uh, for the town was like just a little over $700,000. So, I mean, for Breckenridge, that's not much. We use that money. It pays for one extra officer um, specifically to work on education and, and um, those kinds of issues. And then the balance of the fund goes to our child care fund. So um, we expect that the you know revenue might go back up again a little bit next year, but again, it's it's not a huge uh, driver. So um, in terms of marketing, I'll kind of end with that. We don't do any marketing. We, we've had a lot of requests, you know, for the 420 tours, all those kinds of things. We don't do that because we're primarily a destination resort. About 80 percent, 70 to 80 percent of our business is out of state and international. So the marketing. Uh, it shouldn't cross lines. So what you'll find on our website, and if you go to or the ski area website, is really just information, the how-tos, what's allowed, what's not allowed, those sorts of things. If people come into our welcome center, you won't find brochures for the cannabis um, shops, but certainly our staff will let people know where they are, how they can get there. There is a free shuttle that goes out there so we don't hide it, we don't promote it. It seems that, you know, they're, they're, um, no one that is looking for the business can't find it. So I think, I think that works uh, pretty well. Um, so I think, you know, at, we're watching it at this point, we're really looking at it as it's, it's kind of a non-issue. It's, it's an amenity, um, but we're, you know, staying in close touch with the state and with the city. You know, if that starts to change, then obviously we would, we would change our approach on that. So, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Sal Pace. I'm a county commissioner in uh, Pueblo, Colorado. 
Um, and uh, as an elected official, um, unlike uh, everyone else we've heard from, uh, who is an employee of, uh, of a government, uh, I have the ability to have uh, my own opinions as well without having to uh, make sure that I'm not uh, in competition with my, with my bosses. Um, well, my bosses being the, the voters of Pueblo. Uh, I, I'm not only uh, someone who's been involved in regulation, but I also believe in uh, decriminalization and legalization. I think it makes sense. Um, and I was in the legislature in 2009, and that's when the Obama administration uh, presented the Ogden memo at that time. And the Ogden memo said that the feds weren't going to be enforcing marijuana laws in medical marijuana states. At that point, Colorado already had this uh, uh, home, home grow system in place, and it was structured uh, such under Amendment 20 uh, so that it would be incredibly difficult for anyone to ever catch a home grower. Uh, the state couldn't share the names of these caregivers, et cetera. Um, which has been problematic, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but overnight, with the Ogden memo, and in between the 09 and 10 legislative session, we started seeing hundreds of dispensaries pop up all over the state. Uh, and this is without any regulation, without any licensure, uh, without any rules, without any uh, uh, local uh, land use regulations. And so when we came back in the 2010 legislative session, uh, we tried desperately to put the genie in the bottle, back in the bottle, but so much of what was done and decided uh, was with the understanding that people were already out there investing a lot of their own money and, and building businesses, um, and uh, we couldn't, you know, people felt we couldn't uh, punish people, it was it a takings, if we forced people uh, uh, to close their, their shops. Um, and I think things would have been done uh, Differently, uh, had we had we been able to uh, uh, had a little uh, a little time before uh, before shops started opening, I I cold called the uh, I cold called the uh, only person I knew uh, who knew anything about cannabis. Actually, I didn't even know him. I saw him on TV, and his name's uh, Mason Tavert, and uh, he he's run a lot of the legalization campaigns around the country and in, here in Colorado and. And uh, he, he does these stunts, he'll put on, a, he's, he's a big guy, and he'll put on a toga and show up to uh, parties with politicians who oppose marijuana uh, when they're drinking to stress the, the hypocrisy. He's sort of a, a character. Um, and uh, I cold called him and I said, uh, I'm a state rep and I want to work on regulation, uh, something that's robust but, but fair. And, and he said, hey, I, I, don't do, I don't do policy, I do politics. And he gave me the name of an attorney uh, who he said was a you know, pro bono starving attorney. Uh, and, and his name was Brian Vicente. And now he's, uh, he and his partner Christian are the biggest marijuana attorneys probably in, in the world. Um, and it's, it's ironic to see how that works, but, but Brian and I worked on a lot of language um, to try to make it a, a, a fair system in, in my mind. Um, I'll, I'll stress that early decisions have long-term impacts. Uh, for instance, Department of Revenue insisted that there be a 70-30 rule uh, with cultivation for medical marijuana. Uh, they said that uh, Unless we we required that the stores grow their own medical marijuana, uh, then we couldn't be certain uh, that there wasn't diversion. And the, and and at the time, you know, I, I pushed back. A lot of people pushed back, but um, we didn't want to. We lost that fight. Um, but it, it, it's had long long impact, long-standing impacts. For instance, Denver then said. If you have a store, you have to have your grow in Denver, and then uh, a number of grows popped up in warehouses, and now Denver's uh, busting at the seams, and they can't get a tech company in to, to fill a warehouse because warehouse space is too expensive uh, because of uh, the, the marijuana grows. Um, so in Pueblo County, uh, I was 
I ran for Congress in uh, 2012. I so tell my kids I came in second place and uh, gave up my state house seat to run. But there was a vacancy on the Board of County Commissioners and I was appointed to that. Um, incidentally, marijuana uh, outpolled me and everyone else on the ballot in Pueblo uh, when I ran for Congress. And had my name been marijuana instead of Sal Pace, I would have been elected to Congress. <laughs> um, so, uh, marijuana passed and by a, large, a larger margin than it did statewide. Uh, it, statewide was 55, we were 56. Uh, Pueblo County is a poorer community. Uh, we've had, of the 10 largest counties, we have the highest unemployment, the lowest per capita income. Um, it's, uh, there is a large industrial city in the middle of Pueblo County uh, with a steel making, uh, with a steel background. Um, the, the city's Pueblo, and it's the largest uh, minority majority uh, city in the state. Uh, outside of Pueblo, uh, we have a lot of rural ag land that's been uh, very productive for, for uh, over a century. Um, and if you're going to have green chili, make sure it's Pueblo green chili while you're in Colorado. And so our concern as county commissioners was how do we create sustainable jobs? And how do we create a system uh, to bring economic vitality to, uh, to Pueblo? Um, unlike uh, Denver or Breckenridge, uh, it's always been uh, more of a struggle to, to grow economically. And uh, we've been in uh, essentially a sustained recession for decades when the steel mill closed uh, in the 80s. And so, uh, it's something that's constantly on, on our mind as policymakers. So, um, our first goal was to uh, uh, focus more on the cultivation piece and also on trying to build some, uh, a research epicenter of some sort. Uh, we don't have tourists, however, when we first opened up, and we opened up uh, January 1st, 2014, the soonest you could, uh, for, for sales, the same date as Denver, and I believe we were the only two communities on January 1st. Um, we, uh, we had a little bit of tourism uh, because we were the closest community to, uh, to uh, southern Kansas or New Mexico or Texas. And so for a long period of time, uh, the sales were, were mostly driven by tourism. But once the town of Trinidad opened, 100 miles south of us on the border, uh, we, we lost pretty much all those sales. And, and uh, you know, I, I would say from our perspective, sales were never going to create the type of sustainable jobs. Um, on the cult, and, and we actually put a cap on the number of stores, and I didn't, I didn't realize this at the beginning. Uh, the, the free market, and I believe in the free market, and um, the free market doesn't necessarily stop growth in cannabis uh, like it does in other industries. Uh, we've seen a big, big drop in the price of wholesale cannabis right now, but people is, are still getting licenses for cannabis in other industries that wouldn't happen. And why? Because there's people all over who want to invest in cannabis. It's a green rush. And so uh, you can't always trust the, 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 the free market to actually correct itself in, in cannabis, at least in these early years, I think. When more states open up, it might correct itself. Um, so we put a cap on stores. Uh, we have about uh, 20 licenses that are either approved or uh, in a process, and they've been uh, sitting in a process for a while. But we also uh, made uh, favorable rules for cultivation, for infused product manufacturing. And at this point, um, based on uh, excise tax revenue, and we worked hard to create uh, the ability to have an excise tax at the legislature, uh, we're probably, uh, we think, the second largest uh, uh, cultivation epicenter in the state. We allow outdoor grows, greenhouse grows, um, and in, uh, in warehouses indoors, the utility rates get pretty expensive. It can be 50,000, 80,000 a month. And Pretty much all the big guys in Denver who are trying to stay afloat are now buying uh, their uh, cannabis from Pueblo. Um, I just heard that one of the big chains is doing a uh, 
Uh, Pueblo sailed today. Uh, you can buy $89 ounces grown in Pueblo from now through the election. Um, and so uh, we, we've, seen a, we've seen the type of uh, boom that we expected, uh, better than we expected. Uh, over 100 cultivations, uh, well over 1,300 people working in the industry, over 50% of all construction in Pueblo County last year was tied to cannabis. Literally 50% of all construction. Um, and on the research piece, uh, we've been pushing, uh, growing a research center at our, at our local university, um, uh, Cannabis Studies Institute and uh, at CSU Pueblo. Uh, they're doing a, a number of medical marijuana and impact studies. And if there are impacts, I wanna know what those impacts are. Um, and then with taxes and our revenues, and we just implemented this excise tax, the most exciting piece for me with the revenues, uh, we'll be providing college scholarships for uh, every high school graduate uh, who attends a local college or university. Uh, we started uh, uh, sort of in a small, small scale this year, but moving, um, uh, moving much larger next year. And, uh, you know, I think if you're a community that that has struggled economically and, and uh, sustained poverty, uh, what, what is a better way to help that community than to try to provide college education, affordable college education? Um, so I have a different view on the opt-in, opt-out than, than Lewis. Um, I think the local opt-in, opt-out has been problematic in Colorado uh, because it's not a one-time decision to opt in, opt out. It is a sustained, non-stop decision to opt in or opt out. Uh, and it forces every single community, 317, did you say? 321. 321. All 321 communities have to have this debate and continually have this debate. Because maybe you opt into medical, and then a few years later, you're having this debate, do you opt into recreational? You opt into cultivation? Do you opt into stores? And, and it, it, it creates this nonstop political discourse and over an issue that I didn't think would still be controversial after the vote. But uh, as you guys will see, when you uh, have legalization or decriminalization or medical marijuana in your states, you, there, the opposition uh, gets louder. Um, uh, they, there are folks who see this as, uh, as an inherent evil, and uh, they will continue to be there, uh, at least for you know, a, another decade or two, and it's, it's because it's mostly based on age. Um, and statistically, uh, the younger you are, the, the, the more pro-legalization you are. And so in our community right now, we're facing an opt-out vote initiated by the voters, uh, the, uh, it's a proxy vote for, um, uh, for anti-marijuana folks statewide who saw a small but vocal minority in Pueblo who were passionate uh, about being anti-marijuana. Um, and uh, they're funded by a 501c3 uh, that is housed under an LLC called the Corporation Corporation. Um, and they're probably spending somewhere between a half million and a million dollars. And we don't know because they're not reporting their money. Um, but it's clear that this has become uh, a proxy vote for uh, groups like Smart Colorado, and uh, which is an anti-marijuana organization. And they think if they can reverse it in Pueblo, which uh, I've been calling us the, the Napa Valley of, of cannabis, um, and as a, as a point of pride, uh, we're not the we're not the storefront of cannabis. I mean, that's that's Denver. They sell 40% of all the cannabis. We sell 2% of all the cannabis. But we have a, a significant uh, number of jobs uh, and square footage uh, and investment into cultivation. Cultivations don't have big flashy signs, and so we'll find out in uh, on November 8th if uh, marijuana remains legal. I have a prediction that uh, it's going to remain legal and it will probably, uh, the legalization side will pass by a larger margin uh, than it did in 2012. Um, because uh, 
people are seeing the, the significant impact in our community. Uh, finally, I just want to say home grows and caregivers. And I understand, I understand why the folks who passed Amendment 20 wrote the language to make it incredibly hard to enforce home grows uh, in, uh, in Colorado, why they wrote it the way they did. Um, however, now that we have a regulated marketplace, these home grows are a, uh, they're a scourge, um, and we're having a really hard time uh, addressing this. And myself and, and folks who believe in a robust regulatory system, uh, someone like myself who believes in legalization, uh, finds uh, uh, the caregiver marketplace, the illegal caregiver marketplace, the gray market, uh, to be a huge problem. And I would discourage folks as they're making policies uh, from uh, allowing uh, uh, home grows without a, a set number of plants. If everywhere in your state or community had a, a number of plants that every law enforcement officer knew, you had six plants as the cap that was clear and obvious, um, then uh, you won't have the, the number of folks skirting the rules here in Colorado. Um, and then I'm going to apologize. I actually have a flight in a little over an hour. I've already pre-booked. Pre so I'm going to take off a little early, maybe 15 minutes through the questions. So, and then I'll just talk about Denver quickly so we can move into questions and maybe have a, the beginning of our questions be addressed to um, Commissioner Pace. Uh, Denver, we have about 660,000 residents. As I said early, earlier, we have about 1,000 licenses operating out of 450 or so unique locations. We have 40% of all the licenses in the state. However, we think it really is important that people keep their perspective. I mean, people hear that, and we speak on marijuana all the time. But as you guys are here visiting, marijuana certainly doesn't define Denver. Denver, um, like I think I said, we, that revenue that comes into Denver, it's about 2% of the overall revenue to the city. We also all know that marijuana is on track to be a billion-dollar industry this year. But Colorado's GDP is $330 billion, so it's less than one-third of 1%, 1 or it's about one-third of 1%. So just sort of keeping that perspective there. And Denver just continues, even with the marijuana, even having 40% of the license, we continue to be a great city. We're you know, growing, we're, we're booming on all sectors, people are moving here, we've got you know, jobs, we're just doing great, a lot of building going on. Um, so marijuana is a part of us, but it certainly hasn't defined everything about Denver. So did that quickly with Denver, and we'll move on since Commissioner Pace has to leave and go on into questions. So anyone has any questions for Commissioner Pace to start with? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you're the right person for this. Um, uh, I'm a municipal councillor from uh, Cambridge, Ontario, in Canada. Uh, in Canada, our federal government is going to uh, make it countrywide versus province. Uh, there's a task force that's just coming out with their report, I believe, next month to our Prime Minister on um, the legalization of it. And uh, we will know by spring what type of regulations they're going to be looking forward to, we are going to be looking forward to. My particular ward includes our downtown core with all of the social services, the methadone clinic, the needle exchange, that sort of thing, large homelessness. So when you um, uh, look back on all of this, did you have a, a grasp of that type of a problem in your community? Did you have a baseline that you worked from and did you look out, like you're three years out now, um, do you see an increase in um, um, the, from the uh, marijuana use in the um, leftover debris from the regular drug paraphernalia, or did you find that that has stayed basically the same? So folks who use heavy drugs probably use every type of drug, from alcohol to marijuana to, to, to heroin. Um, it's the type of lifestyle they're living. Uh, as far as increased marijuana use and 
Uh, we heard this earlier from, from Andrew. Uh, there's not been an increase statistically of marijuana use. I will say uh, pre-legalization Pueblo, our community had the highest marijuana use in polling in the state and continues to have the highest marijuana use. Uh, but uh, there hasn't been a statistical change in the uh, amount of use. Um, you know, and, and to be fair to the uh, opponents of legalization in our community, their arguments are that uh, legalization drives uh, gang activities and homelessness and harder drug use. Um, and most of what they have to say is anecdotal. We haven't seen any, uh, any statistics that really uh, reinforce that. Uh, that said, we're paying, a, we're paying a lot of money right now uh, using marijuana funds to uh, CSU Pueblo to study the impacts. And we're anxious to, to see that. I'll mention, if you want to talk about impacts, uh, the AMA has a journal called the um, uh, called internal medicine, peer reviewed, and there's a study that shows in states that have legalized medical marijuana a decrease in opiate uh, overdose of 25 percent, and that's uh, very statistically uh, significant. So um, I'd point to that as an impact as well. I, I have a question, Commissioner Pace. Um, since you mentioned that Pueblo is a minority major majority uh, city, um, sort of in contradistinction to Denver, uh, what does the impact look like for the Hispanic population in Pueblo? Are they um, owning these businesses at the same rate? Are they employed at the same rate uh, as uh, the white population in Pueblo? Are, are we seeing some disproportionate impact on that population and they're by fueling that sort of gang activity among, amongst young people? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question and something we haven't studied and, and something Joan and I have talked about is getting better uh, demographic data about, uh, about the employees. Um, you know, I'm really interested to hear uh, what people are getting paid and what type of benefits they're getting. And generally, anecdotally, I get the impression that the folks who are locals who started businesses tend to uh, do a better job at the benefits and the wages. Uh, but obviously, um, there are folks who move in and invest money, and people have invested tens of millions of dollars building out operations uh, from other, other communities. And we love, we love their investments and the jobs they're creating. But I, I think, and this is just anecdotal, I think the folks who move in from out of town tend to pay less, and they don't have to pay as much sometimes because when they post a job, uh, posting uh, 100 times the number of people apply for the number of jobs available. As far as ownership, I can tell you we have, an, uh, and I don't know a number off the top of my head, but a number of uh, Latino uh, owners of, of uh, dispensaries, cultivations, MIPS. Hi there, Victor Salinas from Portland. Um, I had a question tying into that actually. So you touched on really two, uh, points that interested me. One of them is uh, you, you uh, talked about decriminalization and then uh, creating scholarships or pathways to uh, higher education for your population. Um, in addition to that, are there any measures in place, um, given that historically we know that communities of color, um, low-income communities, um, have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs and have limited access to the, to, um, the industry as far as owning businesses? Are there any measures in place that the, that the local government is putting in to create access? Um, I, I want to give two quick answers. One is we, we have not created incentives, and I think there would be a, a, a big backlash to providing tax incentives uh, to help someone open a marijuana business, uh, especially since one of the arguments for legalization is to receive tax revenue. and. Uh, I sit on the Economic Development Board in, in Pueblo, and we had a, a real robust discussion about this. Um, and we took the position not to provide economic incentives for uh, marijuana businesses. However, we did provide an $8.8 .8 million uh, incentive to a hemp extraction uh, facility. Um, they're still dealing with uh, uh, legal issues with the feds and, 
and uh, how to uh, extract the CBD and, and get into marketplace legally, um, hoping to do it uh, across state lines. And so uh, we, we've uh, crossed that path. I will say, because of the laws against uh, public consumption here in Colorado, uh, al although we have legalized marijuana, the number of arrests for public consumption have skyrocketed uh, since legalization. And part of Amendment 64 said that public consumption was illegal. And so uh, as we got rid of uh, possession for a reason for incarcerating uh, young minorities, uh, there's now a new reason, which is public consumption. And if we don't have public consumption clubs and uh, you know, mom says, you know, uh, you know, to their 22-year-old millennial son, get the heck out of the house. Uh, you know, often that means they're going to be uh, in the streets, and so th that's another problem we need to figure out how to address. Uh, good morning, Kent Heim. I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii, and. Um, Yes, we are part of the 50 states. We're not international. <laughs> um, uh, currently in the um, state of Hawaii, we have, uh, um, it's been legal since 2000 for medicinal uses, and we are now um, opening dispensaries, and there are eight licensees, which and they are um, I'm able to open two dispensaries per license. And they have a single tier where if you have a license, you can open your dispensary, but you have to have your own grow. So I think um, that's trying to address the genie in the bottle issue that you spoke of. And do you, uh, can you foresee any, uh, I mean, you can't foresee everything, but do you uh, see where there might be any flaws in that plan? Because I think what they're trying to do is go slow and kind of maintain that growth. Thank you. I, I think go slow is a, a, a good thing in, for states to take, um, knowing what I know now. Um, so if I were to create a, a model from scratch, uh, I would do a competitive model, and there's a number of states with competitive models. Um, Maryland, for instance, uh, just went through awarding 15 cultivations, 15 uh, MIPS. They're then going to award uh, 15 stores. I wouldn't do the uh, local opt-in or opt-out, um, or if I did it, I would give one date, one vote, uh, for each community to opt in or opt out uh, instead of the continual, uh, constant voting, battling in every single uh, community. Um, the competitive, uh, the competitive uh, piece, um, which Aurora did here in Colorado, and I think was a great, and they were the first community, I think, anywhere in the country to come up with this, where people submit uh, their bids, and the winning bids get, get awarded. So if you don't have local control, how do you, or local opt-in, opt-out, how do you handle it? Do you set up regions in your state and each region gets two dispensaries or one dispensary? I don't think you have to have the, uh, the forced vertical integration though with dispensary and cultivation. If you guys took the tour, you saw the seed to sale tracking system um, and the metric. Um, and RFID tags, you can literally take a scanner, walk into LiveWell's Grow uh, north of here, they've got 35,000 plants in there, take your RFID reader and find one plant that you're looking for. Uh, and from seed to sale, every single gram is tracked. It's impossible to, to divert out of the seed to sale tracking system. And so I don't think you necessarily have to have uh, uh, forced vertical integration if you have a, a robust seed to sale tracking system. I don't know if, I'm, I'm dominating the conversation and I apologize, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm taking off. <laughs> Thanks, Commissioner Pace.
Okay, we're okay. gonna. I'm gonna have uh, Lewis address some of this um, vertical integration and integration questions for us. Yeah, bef before Commissioner Pace leaves, I wanted to thank him too. We've uh, we've had an opportunity to be down south and, and visit some of the outdoor groves, and so uh, uh, that was a real uh, great experience for us and uh, really helpful on some of the rulemaking we did. And and also too, just uh, I was I am allowed to have an opinion. We just have to all agree to keep it here within this room. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> That was such a rude comment I made. I didn't mean to sound rude. <laughs> Hey, I, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, vertical integration. I, you know, I, uh, frankly, uh, to kind of uh, echo what he said earlier, is I don't necessarily have an opinion on it. I, I think I think when you're first getting started, um, one of the um, one component that a, that that people really focus in is how are we going to know whether or not uh, the marijuana that's being sold at the storefront to either patients or uh, customers, how do we know it came from legitimate sources? And so I think back when we first got started. With this vertical integration was a mechanism in which you could start to really account for the marijuana. We've talked about it here in Colorado as being a closed loop system. The regulated system is intended to be closed loop within a regulated uh, marketplace where we track it uh, from seed to sale. And so when you first get started and, and you're competing, you're, you're taking companies that are coming out of the unregulated market into the regulated market. And in Colorado, as, as Commissioner Pace mentioned, and I'm sure Andrew Friedman talked about it earlier today too, um, that uh, uh, there's there's a competing marketplace there that's unregulated, right? So so we to, to really lend some credibility to uh, the the regulated community, that is a mechanism in which you could start to to get some accountability on on the product through the entirety of the of the, the system. Uh, um, having said that, you, you know when when it when it came to uh, retail marijuana, just a couple years later, we started out with a period of time where our licensees were required to be vertically integrated where even the retail marijuana stores had to have a cultivation. But it was only nine months after our first sales that the statutes allowed for uh, for us to have a system within retail where if you if you're a cultivator and that's what you're good at that's what you can do if you're if you're a retail person and, and that's what you're good at that's what that's what you can do so you weren't necessarily required to do that so I think what you might find and I'm sure it's different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction is, is that uh, uh, for the for the reasons you start with a policy, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that those same reasons exist as as the the system continues to evolve. So, Lewis, also, could you share with us? I know you mentioned production management. Can you share with us a little bit about what you mean by that and how you measure production? Sure, I can. But just have one quick thing. I've got about ten texts from uh, colleagues at MED saying that they're happy to come to Hawaii to uh, uh, help out. Their <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> so, so production management. So, in in our in our and again, I'm I'm really referring to the commercialized market, which is in our wheelhouse. And on the medical side, the the what our licensees are allowed to cultivate and sell is is almost exclusively established in statute. Uh, with with mar with retail marijuana, after it was it was passed. Uh, um, the legislature gave broad rulemaking authority to the state licensing authority and basically a clean slate to, to determine what production management should be uh, within the state system and, and how we limit. Uh, as, as I'm sure you're all aware, you know, when you think about this from, a, from an economic standpoint, the, the concern would be is, is that you're either producing way too much, creating an incentive for it to be diverted outside of the state, or you're creating too little, uh, which increases demand, prices go high, and might even create an incentive for that unregulated marketplace to participate unlawfully, or maybe even have marijuana diverted into the state from uh, other other areas. So we thought it was uh, we we were mandated uh, to uh, to to do those kinds of regulations to kind of determine where we should fall with retail marijuana on production management. And the way, and what we did to try and to, to start that conversation is we commissioned a study that the University of Colorado out of Boulder uh, conducted, and and they, they determined that the the overall demand for marijuana in the state of Colorado is like right around 130 metric tons, um, so that's a lot of marijuana, right? So it was and it was mostly focused on the flower, not necessarily uh, inclusive of, of of some of the edibles demand just because there wasn't enough data to make that determination. But at, long story short, through that rulemaking process we talked about earlier, we arrived at an output model. So 
uh, our cultivations in retail marijuana are, are allowed uh, to grow a certain number of plants, uh, and, and they have to be able to prove to us uh, that they're selling a certain percentage of that uh, product that's produced from those plants before they can up their production. And so there's, uh, you know, a, n a number of months that have to pass by so they can't just say, well, I, I want to grow 200,000 plants. Here's my money for uh, to be able to grow that amount. They have to actually be able to walk up uh, the tiers and be able to show that their business is growing, that they're capable of selling what they produce. So any questions for Lewis on that vertical integration and production management model? Okay. So, and Lucy, I had another question for you because I know um, you talked earlier to me on the phone about how you guys, what do you do around marketing uh, Breckenridge with regard to marijuana? I know you've got some educational materials. Could you describe mm -hmm. a little bit of that? Right. We, um, I, I, again, we don't market out, out of state uh, using marijuana as an attraction, you know, certainly to come to our resort. But in terms of the education, we, uh, along with the town and the ski resort, um, make it clear that consumption cannot take place anywhere in, on, in public space. So that's anywhere on the ski resort because that's all federal land, that's in common areas and hotels. That is, you cannot smoke in your car in the parking lot. You can't be on the sidewalk smoking, all those sorts of things. So we um, work hard. You know, there in the first year there were like posters and we did handouts and things. We don't have to do that so much now. It's pretty much web-based. But something that was again looking back to first year learning. Um, in the hotel industry, so whether it's business travel or leisure travel, doesn't matter. It wasn't clear to guests that they couldn't necessarily smoke in their room. So they could go buy pot, and they thought they could smoke. If it's a non-smoking room, it's a non-smoking room. And even um, private condominiums that are rented out, things like that, some owners allow them, most don't. So there aren't actually that many places where you can light up. And, and that was a, a big surprise for people. So again, when you're coming into this, I think just anticipating that those kinds of questions. The other thing on the hotel side that I would offer, in, in case it's helpful for some of you, is that we, we have a, um, with the housekeeping staff, you know, and we've talked about edibles a little bit and how much they look like candy or food and what happened with the housekeeping staff is they would, you know, as they're entitled to, take whatever's left in the fridge or in the room and take it home. And a lot of them not realizing that it was pot and not candy or a brownie or something like that. So it's not only, um, you know, putting the ID and the label on the product, but making sure the staff really understands what that is, you know, especially if you have Spanish speaking people or something like that. So those were two um, big takeaways. We got those corrected pretty quickly right out of the blocks, but there were, there were some unfortunate incidents because we didn't anticipate that. Good morning, I'm Mark Pettinger. I'm actually with the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. This is actually a shout out that I'd like to give. Uh, Oregon has benefited so far by looking at, uh, or, or at Colorado and Washington, and I wanted to, I'm not sure if he's going to be here later today, but I really wanted to give a shout out to Lewis because about a year ago he came out for a conference in Portland and stopped by and spent uh, a generous three hours with our small staff and kind of walked us through all of the issues and the challenges that Colorado had faced and was continuing to face. And it's hard to be a trailblazer, uh, you know, especially when your, your vocation originally was wrangling big game animals as opposed to big mm -hmm. plot, uh, big pot plantations. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge Lewis because he's in the forefront of all of those of us who are in the government uh, regulation space for all the work that he's done and by making himself available and as well as his staff. So Lewis just wanted to acknowledge you. Thank you for your efforts. Thanks. So. Thanks. You know, it's it was my pleasure, uh, and I, I thank you. I'm sure uh, all of us could probably uh, kind of speak to the value in, in uh, being able as government agencies to, to continue to, to meet with one another and, and, and to share a lot of what uh, a lot of what's going on. I, I mean, to you know, kind of shout out back to Oregon and, and Washington and Alaska and some of the folks that have been uh, going through a lot of this uh, uh, with us and in, in other jurisdictions here within the state of Colorado. There's always been a lot of benefit uh, in us getting together because even though we recognize 
recognize that we're, we're you know, part, kind of on the, on the front end of this. Uh, we also recognize the fact that we're, 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 we're maybe not doing everything as well as we could or we're not uh, addressing challenges as, as in, a, in, a, in a same way as another jurisdiction. And so this continued conversation, conferences like this with folks from the regulated community, law enforcement, the industry, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll continue to help us drive uh, really good policy going forward. Thanks again. All right, great. So we're going to.